Okay, I am going to jump into this because you both are very busy. Let's start off with the macro landscape. Investors are extremely nervous and bracing for a tough economic and market environment this year. Where are we in the financial market, economic, and Fed cycle? Is recession around the corner as many are predicting? Well, I think that um, no one ever knows, as you know, whether you're going to have a recession or not. And as you know, we are long, long-term investors. So we realize if we do have a recession, we will recover from that recession and things will get better and better. And so we're always just trying to keep our eye on the long-term uh, perspective of what's going to happen in America. We agree with Warren Buffett that uh, our capitalist democracy is the best system ever invented. And so you'll have these ups and downs. And they're really unpredictable. And uh, at the end of the day, uh, we're, we're optimistic. John, I does that mean, I'm sorry, go, go ahead. ahead. No. Um, I, I, and this is for both of you. Does that mean that the Federal Reserve is close to being done with its tightening cycle? And are we going to see rate cuts later this year? Well, from my standpoint, I think that we are, our view now is more the consensus view. It used to be, if you know, if you talked to us two years ago, we did have a strong, strong opinion that uh, inflation was going to be worse than people anticipated. It wasn't going to be transitory. Therefore, interest rates were going to be higher than people anticipated. It's really rare in our 40 years that we have a strong macro view. But at that point, we really believe in all the things we've learned of being a part of the University of Chicago community and Milton Friedman and other great economists that we'd lost control of our money supply and that ultimately was going to have this impact on inflation and higher interest rates. Now I think we're back at the consensus. You know, we're, we don't think there's a strong mistake being made by anyone. And we do believe that as time goes forward, uh, rates will start to slowly but surely decline as we get inflation under control. Now that we have the Fed so focused on it, and America is so focused on it, our, our, our political leadership and, and the folks that matter in these areas. So uh, I'm confident that we're in a good place. Melody? I was just going to add that should we have a recession, one of the things that we've said, it would probably not be a hard landing. It would probably be a softer one because corporate balance sheets are very strong and the American consumer is still in really good shape. They're still spending down the stimulus money that they got a couple years ago. I mean, there's just been a lot of talk, I think, about a hard landing scenario because of the Fed's aggressive rate hikes and the quantitative tightening of its balance sheet. We've also seen um, a mini bank crisis. Any thoughts there, Melody? I would say that the banking situation is obviously one that is unsettled. But again, just like John is saying, I think everything is being done to make sure that this does not spiral and that we don't have a domino effect. So I have to say I really respect the decisions that have been made thus far. There's not been any sitting on the hands by the regulators around the issues with SVB and First Republic and Signature and some of the other ones that we've seen. And this next group of banks behind them are just much smaller. They have much less industry concentration. It's not nearly the same kind of scenario. And then sadly, but it's true, you know, banks do fail all the time. If you look at any year in our country, we just don't read a lot about it or see a lot about it. SVB was significant because it was the 16th largest bank in America. Um, you know, how have you folks taken advantage of the eruptions in capital markets in the wake of Silicon Valley, Silicon Valley Bank? Um, we did see a really vicious sell-off. And I know that aerial investments thrive and tend to make the best investment decisions during market turmoil. What have you folks been buying or selling? What have you been doing? We've been looking for new ideas and adding to our favorite ideas. So anything that has any cyclicality to it has had a really tough time. Anything that has any uh, ties to the housing market have had a very, very difficult time. So we've been leaning in in those areas, buying more of our favorite names. So like in the housing area, a company like Mohawk that makes carpeting. This is an extraordinarily cheap, cheap stock to us, selling it at over a 60% discount to its private market value. I think it's just a, a super bargain. Uh, when we look at some of the financial services companies that have gotten quite cheap, we've been adding to uh, private equity firms like Carlisle. Um, we've added to the Bank of Oklahoma. 
thinking, taking advantage of the dislo dislocation that we've seen in the financial services sector uh, of the marketplace. And then some of our, our, our light cyclicals, um, we've also been adding there and finding opportunities in companies like Residio that has the, controls the old Honeywell brands that uh, determine the heating in your home and the air conditioning in your home, sort of the back of the house kinds of things. Those kind of light cyclicals we think are very, very cheap in this environment. Melody, any, anything you want what to add? What he said. Okay. <laughs> <laughs> now, how do uh, ESG considerations fit into Ariel's bottom-up long-term style of investing? I mean, I know that this is something that you folks take very seriously. Um, and, you know, if you can expand on, the, are those considerations important or not and why? I'll start, and I'd say those considerations are important and always have been. ESG has become much more popular of late, but if you go back to the founding of the Aerial Fund, our flagship mutual fund, you will see we have these ESG considerations in the fund from its inception. And we've further integrated ESG into our investment process as the years have gone on. We have a dedicated ESG team on the domestic equity side and the international global side. ESG is deeply steeped into each analyst's research because we do think there's a direct correlation between these issues and financial returns. And um, this is not a marketing gimmick or a headline that we think works. We want to mitigate risk in our portfolios. And by considering these ESG factors that could be detrimental to the long-term value creation of the business, we think we're doing just that. And I would just add to the fact that when we started our mutual funds, as Mallory said, in 1986, we were known as a socially responsible fund company. You know, you didn't have the terminology, terminology ESG back then. But from the very beginning, we've been concerned about the environment, concerned about uh, handguns, concerned about governance, concerned about DNI. Uh, all those things have been very, very important. And today, looking ahead 36 years, 37 years later, they're just, if not more important. We have a great team of people making sure that we are evaluating each and every company uh, for its ESG score and helping companies get to where they need to be. Because here in, in America, you know, we focus on small and mid-sized companies, and they can really benefit from our counsel and our expertise in this area. And it's sort of uh, John Oxtoby, who heads our ESG area and his team, are often on the phones with management teams, helping them think through issues some of them hadn't thought through before. But they're open to it. They want to be seen as a 21st century company. And we've told companies, we can't invest in you if you are running yourself like a 1940s company with no concerns for the environment, no concerns for diversity, uh, not having modern governance practices, that's just not gonna work for us. We wanna invest in a company that's looking forward and it's gonna be a 21st century company that's gonna help them with their relationships with their customers, with their shareholders, and with the next generation of employees. We just think it's critically important to be a leader in this area, uh, not a follower. So you do hold these companies accountable. You do check in with them. It's not just sign the papers, we're gonna invest in you, and you're done. You really do your due diligence and you check in with them. We check in with them regularly, we do our due diligence, um, and we stay on top of all the thought leadership in this area, you know, which is really important. We have a couple, of ac two academics on our board of directors, Heather Tooks from Yale Business School, is an expert in the, in the ESG areas. Uh, Martin Kramers, who's the Dean of Notre Dame's Business School, is on our board. He helps with all of our thought leadership. And John Oxby actually teaches a course at the Harris School here for the University of Chicago. It's a very, very popular course in ESG. So we want to stay ahead of the curve on everything that we do, but then we can point to the difference we've been making. So one example around DNI, we can point to the fact that over the years we've been able to get over 55 times we've been able to get a company to have their first diverse board member. And because we push them and nudge them and talk to them about the importance of having diverse perspectives in the boardroom, we're able to make a difference. And we've been able to do that on each of the E, S, and G, because we think all three are very, very important. What do people get wrong about ESG? Um, we've seen politicians actually uh, ban certain asset managers because of their ESG um, remarks. Uh, Larry Fink has become partially the face of this campaign. Just kind of curious, you know, what are people missing about the ESG story? I'll start off by saying I think the politicization of ESG in America is extremely dangerous. It's the wrong direction, and it has implications that I think we don't even understand yet. 
Um, and I would counsel anyone who's thinking about that issue and making it um, a political issue to really think twice. Because again, we're thinking very much about the long-term shareholder value that is created in these companies or destroyed because of a lack of attention to very important and relevant ESG issues. One of the things I think that people do get wrong is to think that there's some kind of compromise you make in returns. That sometimes, that somehow you get lower returns by paying attention to these issues. We think it's just the exact opposite. You get higher returns by paying attention to these issues and ultimately, as I suggested, really understanding the risks that the companies are taking and that you're taking by investing in those companies. And our goal as investors is to mitigate risk. And I think the other part that sort of Melody is touching on is that traditionally people looked at these issues of whether you, you would not buy a certain sector and therefore you were limiting the universe of companies you could invest in and therefore you'd have lower returns because you weren't searching everywhere for bargains and undervalued securities. But if the modern day issue where you can work with companies constructively and talk to them to improve their, their initiatives and their creativity around ESNG and if the company isn't changing and evolving with our society in the appropriate ways over time, then you have the ability of being able to vote proxy statements against them and nudge them to do the right things more aggressively. And ultimately, we find that the vast majority of the time, people want to be seen as a progressive company. As I mentioned earlier, they realize if they're going to have the best employees, the customers, and their shareholders all happy, they have to be progressive in this area. And you see it all the time. And, you know, I mean, you know, I'm on the board of Nike. We understand that we've been a leader in ESG for you know, years and years and years and years. But we also understand the knowledge is the right thing to do, but it's created an enormous amount of excitement at the company. People love feeling like they're part of something that's really important to our society and our country. And then they realize from a perspective and return for shareholders' perspective, if they aren't seen as a leader in this area, their competitors can move ahead of them. And you'd lose market share to weaker competitors if you fall behind on being a modern ESG company. So we think it's just so, so important to do this really, really well. Now, let's talk about long-term value investing, which is your bread and butter. Um, I know that uh, value investors had a really rough several years. Decade. Uh, <laughs> <laughs> I was trying to be polite. <laughs> uh, it was all about the fangs, Facebook, Tesla's, uh, you know, you name it, Apple. Um, now that we are seeing uh, some of that luster go away, um, why is value investing in vogue now? Well, I think value investing is in vogue now because, precisely because growth had such a strong decade. It had become sort of everyone just believed those stocks would just go up and go up and go up and go up, that they were not tied to any kind of normal valuation metrics. and. Um, that's what happens in trends. That's what happens in bubbles. You know, we actually had a chance to uh, talk with Bert Malkiel at our board retreat recently. We ha I had a chance to interview Professor Malkiel uh, on the 50th anniversary of his legendary book, A Random Walk Down Wall Street. And in that book, he shows you all the different bubbles that have hap happened in, this, in the world, going back to the South Sea bubble, to tulip bubble, to stock market bubbles that have occurred from the internet to what have you. And so you never know exactly when you're at the, at the end of a market cycle of things going just too far. But when they burst, they burst dramatically and then create opportunities for those sectors that have been out of favor to finally have their day in the sun. And I think that's what's happened. The stocks just got, got to be too expensive, the FANG stocks. People were buying them as one decision stocks the way they did in the 70s when you had growth stocks selling at extraordinary multiples or during the internet bubble when tech, you know, technology stocks were booming. Those things always come to a bad end, and ultimately value comes back. And, you just call, and unfortunately, sometimes you have to go sort of live through the pain to be able to uh, benefit from the, the being able to take advantage of those opportunities to buy bargains. I mean, there's a lot prices. of great value, uh, value-related companies, but they were so overlooked in the last decade. Um, and I know that uh, they've only become so cheap to the point where you have to really say to yourself, I mean, this is like a candy store. Sure, and also the environment has changed. It was the perfect environment for growth. So the last decade with money basically being free, that really becomes just the lifeblood of a growth stock. 
because you don't the value of that dollar in the future is the same as the value of the dollar today. Once rates started to rise, it was apparent they would have their come up ends. And one of the things we've written about many, many times, you can be a great company and not a great stock. Many of those companies are great companies, great business, but their valuations just overshot what was possible and they were priced for perfection. And perfection did not consider interest rates going up. So now we're in a much different environment. We think that environment favors value investors, not to mention, as John has suggested, the pendulum swung so far. If you just believe in mean reversion, not even the value that is unrecognized in some of the value stocks, you are going to see a better time for value. And if you looked historically at the, the last basically 70, 80, 90, 100 years, and you look at value versus growth over those decades, this last decade was an outlier. It was actually a 12 year period. And so when we look at that, we, as contrarians, natural contrarians, we look at that and we see huge opportunity, not to mention the, the, the valuations that are there. So in a higher interest rate environment, it gets harder. The FANG stocks, it, even if they're great businesses, they've had a bit of a rebound of late, but they can't dominate in that same way forever. And again, if you add in one other condition that was perfect for them, which was the COVID scenario, mm -hmm. where we were all locked in our homes. It was perfect for those companies, Amazon, Microsoft, um, Netflix, et cetera. We Peloton. were glued to computers yeah. and, and, and you know, being in our houses. So, and being connected technologically became a very, very, very big and important deal. What, speaking of COVID, what surprised you folks the most about the financial markets during COVID? Mm. I think, well, the surprise, I don't, you know, the surprise was, I guess, um, how quickly we adapted, you know, that all of a sudden you go from this, this surreal world where, you know, you couldn't go to your offices, you, you weren't supposed to be out in the streets, and it was such a, a scary time, but so quickly, you know, people adjusted. They learned to work through Zoom, and, and all of a sudden the market, as it always does, starts to look to the future and see what's going to look like when things get back to normal. And so we had that severe drought drop. You know, we went into that kind of quick recession, but came bounding out so much more rapidly than I think anyone could have anticipated. So it's just another lesson, the fact that trying to be a market timer just doesn't work. You know, if you tried to time that, you would have never gotten it right. By being in the markets the long term, you can, you can, and taking advantage of the bargains that came about, you can benefit and volatility should be your friend and not a problem. Fastest bear market in stock market history, that that March of 2020, mm -hmm. 22 days, and then that rebound, as John is suggesting, just you know, no one expected it, but the market anticipated it. Right. They saw. Right. Let's talk about emerging markets and how your new team is developing. They start on Monday. <laughs> 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 they will join actually Tuesday. They okay. technically start on Tuesday. Okay. So um, in terms of the, the chief investment officer of emerging markets value. Um, and so we're very, very excited to welcome the whole team. We've had one or two people join already, but the real, you know, they will be in totality together starting on Tuesday. They're actually starting in Chicago. They're going to come here first wow. and spend time with the team in Chicago just to get, you know, embedded and really to, to understand the culture and then they will um, be back in New York at the end of the work week working out of New York. So we're very, very excited um, about this new asset class for us. We also think the timing is very good. EMV, emerging markets value, has been out of favor. And we're contrarians. You know, that's when we think you have the best opportunity to outperform. And so we're, we're eager to get started with them. And we've done this before now. We did it successfully with International and Global, and that was 12 years ago. It's hard to believe, but it's true. And so it's been a very exciting time. I also think it's very important for firms to learn something new. I think that that's important to that you grow and um, you stay curious about new things. And while, of course, our international and global team has emerging markets exposure, having a dedicated EMV strategy will be a great new thing for the firm. Now, I know that P&I is celebrating its 50th anniversary this year. Ariel is celebrating its 40th. What do you consider the most seismic market changes you've witnessed over the last, over the firm's 40 years, and how did Ariel meet those events? 
Well, the couple of seismic events that are just sort of the, were transformative for the firm. The first one, of course, when the stock market crashed in 1987 and was down 22 percent in one day. There was this extraordinary amount of fear. We had never seen anything like it. It came out of the blue. It was a total shock and surprise to everyone. But for us, just at the time, the firm just being four years old, it gave us an opportunity to show people that we were true contrarians, that we were going to live, you know, uh, John Templeton's values of buying when there's maximum pessimism, or as Warren Buffett says, you want to be greedy when others are fearful. So we were able to then call clients during that day and say, send us more money. We thought this is a once in a lifetime opportunity to buy bargains. And uh, it just showed what we were really about and that we were going to live our values under immense stress. Because, uh, you know, losing 22% in one day was just horrific. But we were able to find some great, great bargains that set us up for really a great recovery and great returns for the rest of 87 and into 88. And then, of course, the other financial crisis that was uh, lasted much longer was the 2008 and 2009. You know, and that the lows got tested more than once. It was absolutely brutal. It happened to come at a really bad time for us when, you know, when the market collapsed there and value underperformed and we underperformed our benchmarks. Five years before that, we'd had really great returns. And so all of a sudden, you drop off the really good returns in the past, you have a really bad year. And it tested us a lot because we were losing clients during that period. At the same time, we were underperforming. And that put a lot of stress on all of us. But the good news there is, again, we went back to our core beliefs uh, and bought while there was this sheer panic in the marketplaces and really got some extraordinary companies at throwaway prices. It just didn't make sense, especially if you looked out over a three to four year horizon. You knew these companies were going to come roaring back at some point. So again, in 08 and 09, we took advantage of that during that painful, painful period, bought terrific bargains, and we ended up being number one in our category coming out of the bottom of that financial crisis. Uh, we'd had a top 10 performance in 88 after the market had uh, bounced back. So I think we've just been able to show in those two key periods that if you stick to your guns, clients start to understand that you're going to be the true value investor in times of turmoil. And uh, our team understands it. And now the cool thing is that our team is even more battle tested than ever. You know, all of our senior investment professionals have gone through a financial crisis together. and. Um, so whenever there is a mini crisis like what happened uh, during the COVID crisis or what happened during this recent banking crisis, we know the playbook. We know what we want to do during that kind of an environment. So those have been the two really key tests to us during those periods. And uh, we think those are always opportunities, uh, not something to be fear fearful of. Melody? I was going to just say the exact same thing. I have nothing to add. I was going to say that we did see some style drifters during uh, during the last uh, 24 months because of Fed rate hikes. You've also seen bandwagon investors move into ESG because that's yeah. where the money is. Um, you talked about being battle tested. What's next for Aerial Investments? What's what's in it, what's the next 50 years going to look like? <laughs> wow, it's a long time to think about the next 50 years, but after going through this 40-year uh, this period, I think Melody has been leading you know, uh, the vision for the future, which has been great. Er Melody calls it Ariel 2.0, and she's been using you know, her um, network and her leadership skills, uh, her experience to attract extraordinary talent both you know, full-time teammates here and helping us to run Ariel, but then being able to think about new product areas like Project Black, that's part of Ariel Alternatives and our new emerging markets team. That's all a part of Melody's vision and the ability for her to have the top world-class people leading those new two, those two new areas. So I think when you ask the question about the next 50 years, Ariel will be a more diversified firm than we were the, you know, the first 30 of our 40 years. But we were just fixated on being the best small and mid-cap value manager. Melody started us down that path by bringing us, bringing international and global investing on, on, the, on board about 12 years ago, and then now adding these most recent initiatives. And over the years, she'll be looking for the great opportunities uh, to make sure that we are a diversified, more diversified business over the next 50 years. Let's talk like going about- going slow. I mean, the one thing is I yeah. tell people we add something every decade. 
you know, we started small cap in 1983. We started uh, mid cap in 1990. We started SMID in 2000. We started international and global in 2011. We started Project Black in 2021. And then EMV is this year. And so I think that one of the things you hear from us is we're, whatever we do, it's almost as if it were a concentric circle. It makes sense. If you hear that we're doing it, you say, oh, that's an extension of what they've already done. That the International and Global was an extension of what we had done for so many years in domestic. Project Black was an extension of us because many people say because of our long holding periods at Ariel, a decade, two decades for stocks, that we're like a public private equity firm because we have such a long term horizon. Of course, we do with the turtle as the logo. And so Project Black was just another natural extension. And when people heard about it, especially around its core uh, thesis, it made sense coming from Ariel. You didn't say, well, what are they doing and what do they know about this? And so anything that we add, it won't be, you know, something for everyone. It'll be very, very deliberate and thoughtful where I and the rest of the team believes we can be excellent. We will not just offer things for the sake of offering it. And we won't be a firm with dozens of products. We will never be that. We will be a boutique. And in our areas of expertise, we will have people who know those areas in a deep way. John Small kept investing for 40 years. Rupal Bansali International investing for the last 30 plus years. Henry Doria, Mallory Doria in EMB for the last 31 years, 22 year track record in EMB. So that you hear depth as opposed to us trying to learn by doing. Even again, Les Brun having founded and started uh, Hamilton Lane, such deep long-term experience in private equity. So this is an evolution, part of the evolution of Ariel. Evolutionary. I also used a term lately that that I heard somewhere. It's a bit of a refounding, and refounding in that it has a broader platform, but it's still around all of our core beliefs and our core values. It's still every single thing is about being long term. You're not hearing us talking about a growth strategy or some kind of rapid trading strategy. Everything you hear from us is talking about being patient investors, being value investors, buying things when they're out of favor, seeing long-term growth prospects for those businesses. Again, having expertise in these areas as opposed to being jacks of all trade. Everything we've added is consistent with those messages and will continue to be. So just staying on with Project Black, why the need and how do you see this fitting into improving the wide gap in wealth between black and white households? So we look specifically at the, the story of how Project Black, I've talked about that a lot, how it came to be, which was a call from Jamie Dimon during the summer of civil unrest where George Floyd was horrifically murdered. And he said a lot of people want to help black businesses. Why? Because if you look at the data, if you look at the, the wealth gap in this country, the biggest gap exists amongst black and brown Americans and white Americans. That gap is gigantic. We have negative net worth in the black community versus our white counterparts at similar income levels. And so as a result of that, we said, how can we go to the area that is most in need? We believe in the power of diversity everywhere for all uh, ethnicities, for gay, lesbian, transgender, et cetera. All of that is important. But we were trying to go to the areas of biggest and greatest risk for our society. And to the extent we don't close that wealth gap for black and brown people, we have huge repercussions for all of society. So that's where we went. And then we said, how do we be creative about this? I had this idea. The idea was, could we be tier one suppliers to Fortune 500 companies that are saying, especially at that time, when under so much pressure that they wanted to figuratively and literally diversify their supply chain, figuratively because of the need to show that they were inclusive, but also literally after COVID and during COVID where the supply chain had been compromised. These companies were saying that they wanted to have 10 to 15% of their spend be with diverse suppliers, and yet they were only at 2%. At the same time, 95% of minority business enterprises in this country have less than $5 million in revenue. So even if the big companies wanted to do business with us, we had a scale challenge on our side. So we said, let's meet that scale challenge. Let's go out and buy businesses between $100 million and a $1 billion in revenue. And by virtue of our ownership, my word, minoritize them. 
by installing a majority minority board, by having members of the C-suite be black and brown, by sharing equity throughout the organization, by whenever we have the possibility of diversifying, doing so in um, disadvantaged communities. We said we have the opportunity to have a lever here that could actually change outcomes from lo for lots and lots of people. One last fact, in the entire United States, there are just five black businesses, five, that have over a billion dollars in revenue. Five, that's it. I don't think people realize that. And so you, again, if you're a giant company and you wanna do business with minority firms, you don't wanna write 100 separate $2 million purchase orders. You'd like to go to someone and write a $200 million purchase order. We're trying to create those businesses that can do that. And by virtue of doing that, again, narrow the wealth gap by making sure the success is shared throughout the food chain from the top of the organization all the way to the rank and file. And I would just add, one of the things we've learned here in Chicago, because we've had such a great history of you know, really great black businesses here in this country, uh, in the city, and uh, brown businesses. But you think about Johnson Publishing with Ebony and Jet, you think how important that was to our community. And the Johnson Publishing building on South Michigan Avenue was a beacon of hope for African-American entrepreneurs worldwide. Um, you look at George Johnson, who had the first publicly traded uh, African-American-owned company, Johnson Products, that made Afrosheen and Ultrasheen. And he had over 500 employees at a beautiful factory on the South Side. Again, another good set of uh, role models that they were showing. So young, young people of color could grow up and say, I want to build a business like George Johnson and like John Johnson and employ people. And then secondly, not only did they employ jobs, they got involved philanthropically and engaged in everything from the Urban League to the UNCF to Dr. King's movement, all the different things that had to happen. They worked with other minority businesses that were smaller. Uh, George Johnson in his free time started the largest black bank in the country, Independence Bank, and started Soul Train with Don Cornelius. You think of all the benefits of a strong minority business, and then finally political empowerment. You know, it's just those kind of things really, really matter when you have strong minority entrepreneurs that are really doing really well and they have scale they can have such an enormous impact on, a, on an urban community like Chicago. How will you both measure the success of Project Black? Oh, we have a lot of ways in which we'll hold ourselves accountable. We are not, this is not about anecdotes. This is about metrics. I'm always saying that math has no opinion. So we will be tracking everything right out of the gate in terms of our hiring practices, in terms of the diversity inside of our organizations. With our first business that we've bought Sorensen, which provides tech-enabled service, services for the deaf and hard of hearing, we've already made tremendous strides. When we bought that business, I think one executive in the entire um, executive ranks, out of the entire executive ranks was diverse, out of something like 33, 35 people, and now it's like a third of the group because of the, the, just the Rolodex that we have. You know, I tell people we're our own headhunters. We know the talent that is in this country um, that is poised to lead if given the opportunity. And we want to take advantage of that talent, those friendships that we have. So we have a number of metrics. We have someone in responsible for measuring the impact of these businesses and, and reporting them out to our LPs so that they're very, very clear about what is happening and are we accomplish, accomplishing the goals that we've set for ourselves. So you literally have a data manager well her name is Artie Kodak okay. and she actually is I think she would say more than data no 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 but <laughs> she's responsible for data and um, really the impact that we are having with the investments that we make and they're different based upon the companies we have to have a bespoke approach because each company has different opportunities and this is not a one-size-fits-all endeavor here's a related question to Project Black so I noticed during the COVID crisis a lot of black and brown communities became interested in the financial markets. I don't know if it had anything to do with the meme stocks or Bitcoin, um, but it's a, it's a healthy movement. Uh, financial literacy, I think, should be institu institutionalized into uh, educational systems, um, and you're just seeing the early stages of this take place. What do you folks think about financial literacy for the broader community? So we've been big believers that financial literacy is essential to the long-term financial success of our country and the world. And unfortunately, America is financially illiterate because we don't learn about investing in school. 
I give this example all the time that you can take wood shop or auto in a high school today and not a class on investing, which always leads me to ask people who is whittling, who is cleaning their own carburetor, no one. And yet that class on investing could have profound effects, not only on the individual, but on future generations. Now, one of the things we'd also say, as you think about the financial issues that are, uh, that are, uh, that are at hand for our society, it's going to be a long road to get us to all be financially literate. There's no question about that. But the only way to do it is to do it in small bites. And one of the ways that people have a, a, encounter a lot of their financial knowledge actually is at work. It's in their 401k plan, their 403b, 457, where they get that list of options and they're confronted with a choice. And so using that as a leverage point right now is probably the most obvious and easiest way to try to move the needle in terms of getting helping people to be further along when it comes to being financially literate. The only thing I would add is, is that um, during the Obama administration, I had a chance to chair his task force on basically on financial literacy. It was called the, the Council for Financial Capability for Young Americans. And the concluding documents we gave to the president, we were really trying to inspire financial services companies to partner with urban public schools and utilize the model that we had created with the Aerial Community Academy that was started approximately 25 years ago where we give the kids real money to invest in real stocks and really learn about what the stock market's all about, learn about compound interest, learn about entrepreneurship, learn about job creation, and learn about financial services careers. All those things we think happen when you get a financial services company partner with an urban public school. People always talk about the importance of STEM which is important, but we know how important financial services are to this country. And for some reason, we just haven't thought about that, of you know, not only educating people about how to save and invest, but also how to help prepare them for careers in finance, where you can create multi-generational wealth and economic opportunity for particularly minority, uh, minority students that are in uh, urban communities. So we think that's really, really important. And we would just again love to be a model uh, for how other companies can do what we've been able to do with our Aerial Community Academy. Last two questions. John, you marked an important birthday milestone last month, a belated happy birthday. Oh, no. <laughs> While we're not suggesting you're getting ready to retire, can you speak about the plans in place at the firm to ensure that the next generation is prepared to lead if or when you decide to retire? Well, we have a, a great, great group of uh, next generation leaders. Of course, Melody is co-CEO and we've worked with our board and it's very, very clear that she is the leader of the company going into the future. And that's great to be able to work with the board, to be able to have a great succession plan. And we've had that in place uh, for quite a while now. But then when it comes to the rest of the firm, we're trying to make sure that we're building uh, successors in all aspects of our business. And on the research and portfolio management area where I focus, as I mentioned earlier, we have teammates who are really ready to lead, uh, who've been here for a long time. Ken Kerr, who's been here 18 years or so, uh, Tim Feidler, over 20 years, have taken on more and more and more leadership. Um, we have other colleagues who've been here who, for over, over 20 years, some over 30 years. So we've got a deep, deep team, but we also identified next generation leaders who are stepping up and not only running portfolios now, but we'll take over more and more responsibility uh, over the next 10 years or so. And then that's true throughout the firm, because if you look at what we've done in international and global building that bench as well, with Rupa Bansali and behind her, Mickey Jagadar, when you look at what we're doing with EMV, mm -hmm. that's a whole new team, dynamic team that has worked together for a very long time with embedded redundancies in um, the team and people who are just superstars and quite capable. The same is true of Aerial Alternatives and Project Black. If you look behind Les Brun, there's Charles Corporating. There are other senior you know, leaders within that team that are very experienced and very capable. And we realize the, the burden is on us to make sure that they have opportunities. If you're gonna attract the best people, you have to give them the ball. And so we'll have to create opportunities for them over the long term so they see Ariel as their future, just as I did when I was 22 years old and I joined the firm 32 years ago. I knew I'd work here for a long time, partially because I saw all the opportunity that was uh, here and all the opportunity that I could, could seize should I you know, choose to do so, and I did cho choose to do so. Speaking of which, Melody, what is the biggest untold story of Melody Hobson? Um, you know, just looking at your accomplishments, what you've done with your career, it's hard for, for 
all of us not to be inspired and to admire you, but anything else you have your sights on? <laughs> <laughs> I read a quote the other day I liked so much. They said um, it was in Vanity Fair and even Lagoria said, don't use the word ambition, use drive because it's more palatable to people, <laughs> which I thought was super interesting. I am driven. I, my actually, my college quote was about being driven. Um, I'm driven. And so um, I don't have specific ideas of things that I will do because I try not to limit myself to my own imagination because almost everything that has happened to me was beyond anything I could ever imagine. But I do, I stay open and curious to all possibilities. And I think that's given me a lot of opportunity that I'm not closed minded and I don't have a set, a set view of anything. I never did from, from any aspect of my life of what I was supposed to be. And I think that's helped to keep, to give me lots and lots and lots of options. I had friends when I was growing up who were very specific. I'll be, do this at this age, do this at this age, marry this person, do. I was just never that person ever. I was just, whatever unfolded, I was always confident I would have a good and happy life. And that has proven to be true. So I can't tell you in specifics what is to come, but I can tell you that I always dream big. And I would say that one of the things that's maybe asked what's not recognized about her story is that she's been a real Pied Piper for talent. I talk about that all the time when I'm giving advice to other companies of how do you build a diverse firm in the 21st century. So you get, get a leader like Melody who can attract the best talent. And we have so many great people leaving great firms and great careers to come join our, our small firm because they're inspired by her energy, uh, her commitment to helping others, her commitment to excellence in everything that she does. Really smart, thoughtful people want to come and work here. And I think that's part of the untold story of Melody's leadership. One last question, I promise. What's the one uh, important issue or any type of lasting thoughts you'd like to tell the institutional investing community? What is the untold story of aerial investments? I think that it goes, I mean, I think that in the Melody's leadership here the last 32 years, I think sometimes because we get more of the visibility, people don't really understand the, the depth of the talent that's here all these stars that have been here for 10, 20, 30 years or more, and then some that have gone off and left and done wonderful things outside in the world. You know, we have these great leaders of Jason Tyler's now the CFO at Northern Trust, and Arne Duncan was the Secretary of Education. You know, they all started their careers here at Ariel. I could go on and on, and then the talent that's here that's, you know, we think is second to none. I think people just don't understand the depth and the diversity of the talent that's here and the commitment to excellence um, that we all share and that Melody and I share together. Wonderful. Melody? I would say the two things. One that is very important is this is what we love to do. You know, Warren Buffett says do a job that you would do if you didn't need a job. We love this work. This is what we plan to do. You know, people always ask, what's next? What are you, you know, looking towards? We just want to be good at this. Not just good, but great. And being great is a really hard task. So I think that that's not something that's really understood. We've been here for a long time together, but I always feel like people think we're, we've got like one shoe out the door. We don't, this is it. <laughs> we're just here doing, this is it. You know, there is no other part of the story. This is the job and we like the job. And then the other thing I would say, and I don't think it gets a lot of attention. I don't think many companies have a co-leadership model like we do that has worked as effectively as it has. You know, we're co-CEOs, we truly, John and I truly love and respect each other. I mean, it goes deep. I had someone tell me the other day, you love him deep. I love John deep. I love this firm deep. And I know he feels the same way about me. And I think that's one of the reasons that we've been so successful together, even when we disagree, and we disagree a lot, a lot, there's a, there is a, a basic anchor of, of respect. Um, and that respect for each other allows us to get through whatever it is that we need to get through. So I don't think that story is really understood and that that co-leadership model, I, I'm just shocked more people don't do it because it work, works so well for us. We divide and conquer. It doesn't work for everyone. Yeah. And, um, and I would just <laughs> add the two. Yeah, we, we talk multiple times a day. 
there's no decision that I make, you know, business or personally without coming to Melody to get her thoughts and her advice and her counsel because of the respect, you know, and love I have for her and, her and the admiration that I have for her. And she's always going to tell me, uh, not, not always what I want to hear, you know, but the things that I need to hear when you're making some of the toughest decisions that we all have to make in life. So I think that's another part of the story that's maybe not well understood. Thank you so much for your time. I appreciate it. P&I appreciates it. Thank you Thank very you. much. Thank this you. was excellent. Thank you.